Newark, New Jersey, 1935. A famous mobster made his way to Palace Chop House restaurant, where the meeting was supposed to take place. Upon arrival, he met with the three other already gathered men. They were alone, having dinner and discussing business, not suspecting a thing. At the same time, two strange men were having a smoke, getting ready to join the rest of the guys at the table. They were not invited. However, that did not bother them, because they had a different scenario planned. That scenario was supposed to stop the involvement of the government and therefore prevent the bloodshed. But who were they? And what was their plan? This happened in October, but what actually led to this moment happened a few months earlier. You see, Dutch Schultz, the previously mentioned mobster who was now in the restaurant, wanted to take out a lawyer. Despite it being forbidden by the boss, as it would bring too much unwanted attention, he vowed to do the job himself. The boss was not fond of his cheeky and impatient behavior, so he ordered a hit on him. Now, the time was passing by, and the two men were getting nervous. In that exact moment, the target finally got up and went to use the bathroom. It was perfect time to act. The men dropped their cigars and stormed in the restaurant through the back door. They pulled out Tommy guns out of their suits and opened fire at Schultz and his associates, killing them almost instantly. The job was done in a matter of seconds. Hitman jumped into a getaway car and drove into the night. But what they didn't realize was that Schultz was not dead yet. He somehow survived and dragged himself to the table calling for help. Passersby noticed what happened and immediately called for ambulance. While on deathbed, before sleeping into coma and dying soon thereafter at the age of 33, he rambled to police officers. No one understood, but what he was trying to say were the names of the killers. Charlie the Bug Workman and Emmanuel Mandy Wise, who made bloodbath that night what would later become known as New Jersey's version of St. Valentine's Day Massacre. With no witnesses and no leads on the murders, the case went cold for years. Shakespeare said of kings, uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. The same might be said of those who rise to the top of organized crime. They get there by violence, and often as not, they leave by violence. What is Murder Incorporated? If we go back in time before the incident took place, we will get an answer. New York, 1930. The Castellamariz War broke out between two most powerful bosses, Joe the Boss Masseria and Salvador Maranzano, both from the same town of Castellamare del Golfo in Sicily. It was one of the bloodiest wars in mob history as both bosses fought for power and control over New York. In 1931, upcoming mob leader Lucky Luciano would come up with a plan to take out both bosses and restructure the way Mafia worked, as too much attention and blood was raining down on them. He called on one of his most trusted hitmen to do the job, Albert Anastasia one of the most ruthless and feared figures in American history, often called the one-man army and Lord High Executioner. Anastasia did exactly what he was told. Masseri and Maranzano were both dead along with their bodyguards, putting an end to the war. Lucky restructured the mafia and along with the Jewish mobster mastermind, Mayor Lansky, created a governing body known as the Commission. Now, the only thing missing to the Commission was the enforcement wing, to carry out the orders. Not long after, in 1933, a new entity was about to be unleashed on the streets of New York. A group of the most ruthless mob hitmen were about to put fear and terror in the underworld. This group was an enforcement arm of the mob, under the command of two intimidating figures, already mentioned Albert Anastasia and Lepke Buckalter, a fearsome racketeer in the clothing industry who ultimately answered to the boss of all bosses, Lucky Luciano. 
notoriety earned the group a name of Murder Incorporated, which was actually given to them by the media. Murder Inc. had its roots in the Brownsville neighborhood of Brooklyn, an area known at the time as the Jerusalem of America due to its 300,000 Jewish residents. Its streets were run by the Shapiro brothers, led by Mayor Shapiro, the self-styled boss of Brownsville. A short, chunky young man called Abe Kid Twist Rells had other ideas though. Along with few friends, they decided to take out the Shapiros and have Brownsville all for themselves. Mayor Shapiro survived a full 20 assassination attempts before Rells' crew targeted his brother, Irving. Acting on a tip-off, they abducted him and dragged him into the basement. Rells himself fired a fatal bullet. The Shapiro empire quickly crumbled. The Brownsville boys were the new underworld kings. So, who were members of Murder Incorporated? Where was their headquarters? And how would they carry out the hit? Murder Inc. was made of some of the most vicious men in America. It included approximately 200 members who committed more than 1,000 murders. This organization was separated into Jewish and Italian sides. Each group was called in to eliminate target within its own ethnicity. Jewish side consisted of Martin Bugsy Goldstein, Emmanuel Mandy Weiss, Ali TikTok Tannenbaum, Seymour Blue Joe Magoon and others, while the Italian side had the likes of Harry Happy Mayon and Frank the Dasher Abandando. The hitmen were paid a regular salary, as well as $1,000 to $5,000 per killing. If the killers were caught, the commission would hire the best lawyers for their defense. Most members joined the group for obvious reasons, the money. Although there were some members who joined out of pure joy of killing and thus volunteered for every hit, such as Harry Pittsburgh Phil Strauss. Estimates put the number of victims who died at his hand at close to 500. All members were savage killers, and each had a favorite method of killing. They used various brutal ways to eliminate their victims, such as shootings, beatings, drownings, live burials and ice picks, which is ironic considering all of them ended up dying in brutal methods themselves, which you will see later in the video. But hits though weren't necessarily quick. The crew were meticulous in their planning and would take as long as was necessary, being as professional in their tasks as possible. They needed to be efficient, dispassionate and cold-hearted. The group operated out of a Brownsville candy store, which still stands today. Even Murder Inc.'s female supporting cast had their own vivid nicknames. The store's owner was Rosie Gold, otherwise known as Midnight Rose on account of her establishment being open 24 hours a day. Those hours were perfect for an on-call, round-the-clock hitman outfit. The phone at the store would ring and, once the most suitable personnel were selected, off they would head into the dark Brooklyn night to solve the problem. Although they mainly operated in New York, they also received commissions from other crime bosses across the country, from Los Angeles all the way to Detroit. Farming these jobs out to freelance hitmen left local mobsters and their men protected by tight alibis, and by the time a body was discovered, the killer would be halfway back to New York City on the train. The killings were done almost identically each time. You see, Murder Inc. would hire one man to steal a car for the getaway, while another man would be the finger man, the one who would point out the target to the actual hitman. Then of course, they needed a getaway driver, and a driver of a crash car, a legitimately registered car that would crash into a pursuing police car after the deed was done. The reason for the legit car was that the driver of the crash car could claim it was just an accident, while Hitman escaped in the stolen car. The beauty of this routine was that each man involved in the murder would have a limited knowledge of the other man involved in the hit. The man who stole the car would not know who purchased the guns or who did the actual shooting. This death squad was well trained. They knew exactly how, when and where to do the job. Even though they were sent to eliminate a specific target, they would often apply a valuable lesson, which most of them learned by going to prison. Leave no witness behind. Who 
Who were Murder Inc.'s most famous victims? George Whitey Rodnick While the slaying of this lone shark, suspected to be a government informant, was particularly brutal, Rodnick was far from the most significant Murder Inc. victim. However, it was his case that would eventually catch up to the crew. Joseph Rosen The owner of a trucking firm put out of business by Lepke Buckhalter. Rosen was subsequently murdered on Buckalter's orders as a precaution against him talking to chief prosecutor. Dutch Schultz Remember when we talked about the murder of Dutch Schultz and how the case with no witnesses went cold for years? Well, it started unraveling as the time was passing by. Thomas Dewey a special prosecutor charged with destroying organized crime in the city was leading a large team of investigators, and the bookish Dewey fearlessly had the mob's bosses in his crosshair. Dutch Schultz, the mobster who hadn't made the board of the syndicate, was one of the first to be targeted by Dewey. His first conviction for tax evasion didn't stick though. Even though he was not found guilty, the hot-headed Schultz wanted to punish Dewey for even targeting him, and that proved to be an unwise decision. Despite Luciano's and Anastasia's efforts to keep the law enforcement out of the business by taking Schultz out, it backfired. You see, with Schultz out of the frame, Dewey needed a new target to focus on. Lepke, Buckhalter and Lucky Luciano were now in Dewey's sights. On June 7th, in 1936, Lucky Luciano was convicted on 62 counts of compulsory prostitution, and on June 18th, he was sentenced 30 to 50 years in state prison. This shook the world of organized crime, and the fear arose among the mafia, because if they can get the boss, they can get anyone. But there was still Buckhalter left, and Dewey was after him. By September 1936, Lepke Buckhalter was about to be arrested on racketeering and narcotics charges, as few witnesses were about to testify against him. But his friend Anastasia killed the witnesses, while Buckhalter vanished into thin air. $5,000 was offered for the information leading to his arrest, but he was nowhere to be found. Four years later, 1940. The rumors started spreading that Buckalter was seen in Poland and in Palestine. This was of course false, because all this time he was hiding under their nose in Brownsville. The tension was rising, and eventually the rest of the commission ordered Anastasia to give up Buckalter, as his disappearance was bringing too much heat. Eventually, he talked to Buckalter and convinced him that he arranged the best lawyers who made a deal with the FBI. The deal was supposed to send him to prison for a few years, and after that he would be a free man. Buckhalter, of course, agreed. He finally surrendered to the FBI in front of a Manhattan hotel. Except, he didn't end up getting a few years in prison, but Joseph Rosen's murder attached on top of his racketeering and narcotics charges. He ended up on the electric chair, and therefore would make the history by becoming the first mob boss to end his journey by death penalty. After Buckalter's death, Brooklyn's law enforcers had around 200 unsolved murders on their books. It was, however, not a figure that scared a new wave of mob busters, led by the incoming New York District Attorney William O. Dwyer and his assistant Burton Turkus. Turkus received a tip-off about the involvement of Kid Twist Rells and Bugsy Goldstein in one of those many unsolved homicides, and pursued his prey like the hungry wolf. Many lower-level mobsters were rounded up and imprisoned, deceived into believing that they had been ratted out by their bosses. Almost all of them were killed in an old rusty electric chair behind the walls of the Sing Sing prison. As a result, the rest of the mobsters started to sing, with details of slayings, who, how and why, revealing details to a grateful prosecution team. But that still was not enough, as many mysteries were left buried. It wasn't until 1940, when Abe Kidd Twist Rells suddenly swept sides and became an informant, 
offering a bunch of information to authorities about unsolved murders in order to save himself. After realizing that he'd received the death penalty if the investigators successfully prosecuted him. Rels was also motivated by a fear that the mob would get to him. The witness protection program was offered by the authorities and that was undeniably preferable than being the victim of a hit himself. The reliability of Rels' testimony was confirmed by the depth of detail he provided. He literally knew where the bodies were buried. And as he coughed up murder after murder after murder, he didn't hold back the names of the responsible ones. His former colleagues Strauss, Mayon and Amandando were now very much on the radar. In the witness stand, facing the angry stares of his former associates, Canary Rells didn't stop singing. Rells' song was a full-length opera, Turkus later wrote. Key murdering members all ended up receiving death penalty. Mayon and Abandando were found guilty and sentenced to death. After a successful appeal but then an unsuccessful retrial, the pair met their demise via the same old Sing Sing electric chair just like Emmanuel Mandy Weiss and Louis Capone. In a separate trial, Goldstein met the same fate. And as for the Strauss, well, Strauss claimed insanity. Except the jury did not buy it. He ended up on the electric chair as well. Even though Rels' testimony had condemned these men, Ali Tannenbaum, Seymour Magoon, Abe Pretty Levine and Sholem Bernstein also agreed to testify against their former colleagues. In November of 1941, the men were held under witness protection program in the Half Moon Hotel in Coney Island. The hotel as well as their rooms were under police protection 24 hours a day. Despite police efforts to keep Rels safe, on November 12th in 1941, Rels was found dead on the restaurant's roof down his room. His death remains a mystery to this day, but the most likely theory is that the police were paid off and thrown him out of the window. Rels proved to be the canary who could sing but not fly. A lot of the cases he was said to testify for, well, they fell out of the window as well. Now, the main suspect was Albert Anastasia. All five policemen who were in charge of keeping Rels safe said they have fallen asleep. They claim to know nothing, hear nothing and see nothing. With no witnesses and no leads, charges on Albert Anastasia got dropped. But what we do know is that the hit on Rels could not happen without Anastasia's approval. Anastasia tried to evade the hand of justice for some time, but not for long. On October 25th in 1957, Albert Anastasia was shot and killed in a barber shop at the Park Sheraton Hotel in Manhattan. Shortly after Anastasia's murder, East Coast organized criminals held a meeting in Appalachian, New York to distribute Anastasia's records. It later came to light that Albert Anastasia was actually killed by the order of a rival mobster Vito Genovese and Anastasia's underboss Carlo Gambino who took over his place as what is now known as Gambino crime family. Perhaps it was inevitable that this Italian-Jewish collaboration would ultimately implode, thanks to the prosecutor's energy and the willingness of certain people to backstab their friends, Murder Inc. disappeared. Abe Rels seems to have foreseen such an outcome and it was he, the original Brownsville boy, who showed the keenest survivalist tendencies in the last years of his life. Although the crew faded into the memory, they are immortalized in the stories, literature and television shows such as Boardwalk Empire and Clayton Allen's comic book Brownsville from 2006. Without any doubt, Murder Inc. remains to be one of the most shocking things the Mafia has ever produced. Considering the Italian Jewish mob is still very active in the whole of United States, one may wonder, is there ever going to be Murder Inc.? Part 2